Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. God has awakened us to yet another new day in this bright new year. Let us give God thanks and let us rejoice in it. Our morning prayer begins on page 33 of our Books of Common Prayer and on to page 35 and following. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among nations, and in every place incense is offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Blessed be the Lord our God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and our joy. We pray together. Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to offer you our worship, praise, and thanksgiving. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of all goodness. Let our worship bear witness to your peace and saving power. Through your spirit, may we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. The Jubilate. O oh, shout to the Lord in triumph all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his face with songs of joy. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Come into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good, his love and mercy is forever, his faithfulness throughout all generations. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We come to this point that we have this opportunity to open our hearts in confession to Almighty God, who is merciful and will forgive us our sins if we confess. And so we bring before God this morning all those things that weigh on our consciences. And let us pray together as we ask for God's forgiveness. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Now we come to that point where we have the, the psalm appointed for this morning, and that psalm is Psalm 103, found on page 601 of our Books of Common Prayer. Psalm 103. We recite the psalm together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your infirmities. He redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with mercy and love and kindness. He satisfies you with good things and your youth is renewed like an eagle's. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all who are oppressed. He made known he made his ways known to Moses and his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. He will not always accuse us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For the, as the heavens are high above the earth, so is his mercy great upon those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. As a father cares for his children, so does the Lord care for those who fear him. For he himself knows whereof we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. Our days are like the grass. We flourish like a flower of the field. When the wind goes over it, it is gone, and its place shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures forever on those who fear him, and his righteousness on children's children. On those who keep his covenant and remember his commandments and do them. The Lord has set his throne in heaven, and his kingship has dominion over all. Bless the Lord, you angels of his, you mighty ones who do his bidding, and hearken to the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We will now have our first reading, which is from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 52, verses 3 to 6. Isaiah 52, verses 3 to 6. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, Long ago my people went down into Egypt to reside there as aliens. The Assyrian too has oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what am I doing here, says the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away without cause? The rulers howl, says the Lord, and continually all day long my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, on that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here am I. This is the end of the reading. Thanks be to God. So we continue with the Benedictus on page 40 of our Books of Common Prayer. Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel. You've come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. Through your holy prophets, you promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our forebears, 
and to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous before you all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine upon those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. So now we come to our second reading, which is taken from the Gospel of John. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the end of the reading. Thanks be to God. You are Alpha and Omega We worship to God's guidance and inspiration as we reflect on his word from the Gospel of John. Jesus, as John put it, with his first sign, turning the water into wine at Cana in Galilee. We know the scene we know the story, the village of Cana, around that region called Galilee, yes. And the other little villages around, Nazareth is not too far away, the other villages around the lake. And this is a wedding that's taking place. And it would seem that, you know, all kinds of people are invited, all the villagers and all the people around, Jesus' mother is there. Jesus himself is there with his disciples. Hospitality has been extended 
to quite a wide group. Then, you know, embarrassment threatens because the wine has run out. What an embarrassment that will be for this young couple just being married. That sh the shame of that will live with them for a very long time. Perhaps in that village they will never be able to erase it. The whole family that will hang like a cloud, a dark cloud over the entire family. What happened at their wedding? Reflecting on the husband and his ability you know, to provide a, you know, by this very beginning disaster. So Mary, Jesus' mother, is aware. She's also aware she has been there with Simeon. And, you know, she's been there, experienced the inn with the shepherds, you know, telling her who the child was. She has been there, and she knows that this child is special. This child is born to be savior, is what the angel had said to her. This child, she knew Jesus, now a man, is capable you know, he's a spe special from God and he's able to do things as God's savior of his people. So she appeals to him, you know, very simply, you know, they run out of wine and all that Jesus, just as she knew all the implications, Jesus knew all the implications for this family. But Jesus is a little concerned. As far as he's concerned, his time has not yet come. This, you know, he doesn't want, for him, he, Jesus feels that he's not quite ready. But I guess Jesus, we see that Jesus responds. In the face of this great, you know, challenge that this you know, newlywed couple faces, you know, the consequences for them as, as self-respecting people in this village, the consequences for them and the whole family, Jesus is moved to really respond to their need. And so he responds and we know what happened. His response, of course, is, God always responds, a great response, over and above what anybody could imagine. When I read this myself, you know, several things come to mind. One of the things that, you know, comes with me, it reminds me of Jesus' name, one of the names by which Jesus is called way back in the Old Testament, Emmanuel, God with us. It says to me that in all our situations, a very ordinary situation, a wedding celebration, you know, whatever, going about our business, traveling on the bus, you know, playing a football game perhaps, you know, or chatting with the neighbors, whatever. You know, God is in the midst of us, really. And I wonder if we have a sense, sometimes we have a sense that God is with us wherever we are. We can call on God at any moment, in the midst of the, all the events. Of, nothing is too trivial and lowly. And if it affects us in some deep way, God is there and God is, will respond. We can call on him, you know. And, as, and it, it talks about our, you know, the brothers and sisters as well, because it was Mary who pointed out the situation to Jesus. So we see our brothers and sisters in their trials, and we too can bring their situation before Jesus. It's not just only about ourselves, you know. It includes us, of course, but also we think of others in their situation. We bring their situation before Jesus who is able to respond. And all it responds with that deep sense of empathy and love for, for people. He's in the midst of our situations and we respond as we ask and as others bring us our needs before him, intercession, you know? So Jesus is in the midst of, we let us always have a sense that he's always, whatever we are doing, what we might consider very important, but even the very ordinary things that we might even think that that he is in the midst of it, but he is. Very accessible. We can call about, uh, uh, on him and he will respond. No situation is too trivial. You know, and that's a very important point for us, I think, to note. Our own and those of others whose situations we are aware of and who are in need. And Jesus is able to do it. He is able to meet the needs that we have. And his response, of course, uh, in this case, we see that, you know, all the amount of wine that, that Jesus made, you know, these 30-gallon jars, six of them, you know, huge amount of wine, that's God's magnificence, God's, you know, overwhelming, you know, generosity as he responds, we, you know, way beyond our expectations. 
So this couple threatened by that disaster of shame now have enough wine that they could even sell some and, and, and indeed, rather than that shame, find themselves perhaps in a position where they can have extra money if they were to sell that wine. Obviously everybody couldn't drink it out. So they're in so much a better position that perhaps they had feared. F-E-A-R-E-D. A much better position. So that embarrassment has been transformed into you know, a great excess, if you want. More than they could even uh, expect. And that is how God deals with us as we ask in our situation. We could only see so much God, you know, God is overwhelming in his generosity. And this is what we see here um, in this the response to the particular situation. So, yes, Jesus is in the midst of all our situations. Yes, we must be afraid to bring our needs before him in even the simplest cases. Not forgetting our brothers and sisters as well who we are concerned about. We can bring them. We can look at this passage in, you know, in a somewhat, you know, I wanted to say deeper, but it's a different way. Jesus takes water and converts it into wine. Jesus is able to transform according to the need of the situation, transform our lives, transform us, transform our situations, you know, transform them. He's, a, he's, a, he's able to transform even the worst of us. Even the worst situations could be transformed so that they, they, they become filled with new possibility. Situations that seemed hopeless and now transformed into situations of new hope and new possibility. And that is what Jesus is able to do for us. And we need to bear this in mind as we go out into the world and we face all the situation. Jesus is in the midst of it, ready to respond. And he's able to do far more than, it, than, than we can ask or conceive, as we usually say. So God's abundance is one of the things, his ability to transform. And Jesus will transform, you might say, those jars were water for the purification rites of the Jews, you know, which, which um, is external. Supposedly, it should remind them, too, of the need to, re to present themselves pure before God. But Jesus will do a new thing, that the purification that we will get is by his blood. By his blood, we will be set free from sin. We will be set free from sin. By his blood, our sins will be wiped away, we'll be cleansed, we'll be purified. And we might see this as, a, as some indication, pointing, you know. The burning banquet itself points to something in the, in the future. It's a foretaste of that great wedding banquet that we read about in Revelation. When all God's people come together, you know, and that we represent, that's is sometimes represented as a great banquet. The marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding supper. So this, this particular uh, passage also points us to what is yet to come, what we who are believers can look forward to. And Jesus, John tells us, and we know that John's gospel is organized in a way around various miracles that other gospel writers would call them, but he calls them signs. And John organizes in his gospel seven signs. And this is the first, where Jesus turns water into wine. And the sign, of course, as any sign is to point out something, it is to point to who Jesus is. And the question for those people, the guests who are there, do they have any inkling of what, it, you know, what the sign is pointing them to? Did they pause to reflect? John doesn't comment on this here, you know about the people, but he did say that his disciples, Jesus' disciples, saw this sign and they believed. He revealed his glory, verse 11 tells us, and his disciples believed. So the disciples, yes, they've been with Jesus for a little while, yes, because this is quite early, but to them, with the experience so far of Jesus and this particular experience, it points them to who he is 
and John will continue to speak to us about other signs that Jesus will do. Healing of the royal official's, official son, which we will do, look at tomorrow. And as we go through John's gospel, healing of the man who has been sick for 38 years, you know. Um, feeling of the 5,000, all these things, finally, you know, we are building up. The signs are being more and more pointed, more and more powerful signs of who Jesus is. The final one, of course, is Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. So this is the first sign. And the question for us is, did those guests really pick it up? You know, were they very aware? Because we don't have a sense that everybody else was aware. You know, many people were aware. Certainly the disciples were aware, and some were aware. But as John goes on, you will see more and more Jesus doing marvelous things, signs, pointed, of course, to who he is, the one come from God. Jesus, Savior of the world, revealing himself more and more through those miracles that only he, who is the Son of God, who came from God, will be able to do. And the question for us as well as we continue to read the Gospels and all that Jesus has done, are we, like those disciples, do we see his glory revealed and do we really believe? In King of Galilee, Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. May we too be strengthened in our faith in who Jesus is. May, we, may he continue to be in the midst of us as he is. May we recognize him in the midst of us in all our situations. May we give him thanks and praise. May we call on him in our times of need. May we recognize in our daily life that he is journeying with us. The Lord be with you. We continue with the Apostles' Creed, page 42. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that our Savior has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We now have the collect for today. And so we have moved over into the season of Epiphany. And we... Our collect then is on page 160, the collect for the Epiphany. Let us pray. O oh God, by the leading of a star, you manifested your only Son to the peoples of the, of the earth. Lead us who know you now by faith to your presence, where we may see your glory face to face through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And so we continue in prayer. 
to your hands, Lord, we commend ourselves this day. Let your presence be with us to its close. Strengthen us to remember that in whatever good work we do, we are serving you. Give us a diligent and watchful spirit that we may seek in everything to know your will and knowing it may gladly perform it to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We thank you for the gift of your holy word which continues to guide us in our lives and strengthen us. You know, may this word really reach our very hearts, Lord, and may we really live it in our daily lives. Pray for your church worldwide, Lord, all those who are ministers of your word, all those who are believers in this world. We pray, Father, that we will also live our lives, that our lives will speak of your presence with us. We will be making a powerful testimony to your Son, Jesus Christ, and his presence among us, and his power. We pray for people in the whole world, wherever they may be, who are in unfortunate circumstances. Because of things happening in the country, from man's inhumanity to man, natural disasters. You know, we pray especially for those who are suffering from this COVID-19, for countries you know, swamped by this COVID-19 pandemic. Father, we pray that you inspire those who are involved in, in managing the situation. We pray that this vaccine will, will come on and will become pretty universal in a short time. People will organize the efficient ways of doing this, doing this so that our pandemic might not so dominate our lives, Lord, bringing sickness and, and death to some. Pray for our own country, those you've put in charge of us, or Prime Minister, members of Parliament, or members of Cabinet, all our decision makers. Guide them, Lord, and give them that openness that they would seek your guidance. We pray for your church in this land. Particularly, we pray for the Anglican Church in the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. We pray, Lord, for our Bishop Claude and for all our clergy and all our people. In this, in this land of ours, may we be in the forefront of all that is good for others, all that seeks to build up others and help to solve all the difficult problems that people face in this land. May we see it as our responsibility to make you known, Lord, among all the people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we lift up all those who are in any kind of difficulty, those who are sick and suffering, those who do not know where the next meal will come from, families where there's trouble, Lord, families where there's been murder of loved ones. We pray for all those situations where people are crying out in their great need, Father. We pray for your intervention, we pray especially for your church in this place, that we will be very present, that your love will be made known in all these situations to us. So bless us and inspire us, Lord, as we seek to help others. For all those in any kind of need today, Lord, we lift them up to you. We pray, Lord, that they experience your presence and your power. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray the prayer of dedication on page 47. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all persons in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.